Many observers have noted the advent of the electric vehicle as being a revolution for uh, certainly the automotive industry, our society generally, and business especially. Uh, and, and this does represent a very, very big change, uh, especially first for the automotive industry. But have we been there before? Uh, the answer to that is yes, perhaps not in as sweeping a way as this conversion will be, because this one is calling for uh, more than half of the uh, vehicles built by 2030 in, the, in North America to be electric vehicles. But has the automotive industry faced major changes like this before? And yes, it has. And so the Mobility History Committee of SAE International felt that it was important to remind automotive engineers and industry people who had been there before of how the industry has faced major change like this in the past, and also to hopefully inform and educate uh, a whole new generation of automotive engineers and other industry people who have not been through uh, a major change like this. Uh, and so we put together an exhibit for WCX, the Automotive World Congress for um, SAE International this year that addressed just this point. Because in the past, our world has changed. And as a result of that change, we have faced a new reality. And where has that happened before? It's happened in several key areas in the automotive industry in just the post-World War II years. The first that comes to mind is in automotive safety. And safety in motor vehicles has been talked about as long as there have been motor vehicles. Uh, in the post-war period, you could buy a 1949 Nash Air Flight with seat belts if you wanted it. Preston Tucker's magnificent car, the Tucker 48, which, uh, which unfortunately only 51 prototypes were built, featured safety as a very big selling feature in, in many, many uh, aspects of its specification. Other automakers went down this road too. Kaiser Fraser in 1952, introduced its Manhattan as, the, as a safety car uh, with the seven point safety front seat recommended by Parents Magazine. Uh, as beautiful a car as the 52 Kaiser Manhattan was, unfortunately, safety didn't bring many people to, into the showrooms. In, and then finally, in 1956, the Ford Motor Company really, made safety a major selling point with the introduction of lifeguard design in the 1956 full-size full Ford cars. But again, that was not a sales winner and people instead flocked to the then new small block Chevrolet V8 at the competitor's showrooms down the street. So safety really was something that the industry learned it should stay away from as a, as a sales and marketing uh, hallmark. But things changed fairly shortly after that failed 1956 attempt by Ford to sell safety. Customers indicated more and more that safety was going to be on their shopping list as a feature or as a consideration in their choices. We had many new import brands entering the North American market in the 1950s. And in particular, the Swedish company, Volvo, uh, made safety a selling point. In 1959, it introduced the three, not just standard seat belts, but the three point uh, seat belt as a selling feature for its, its cars. And Volvos were reaching in an important opinion leader audience, especially uh, in the major cities and in the coastal areas of the United States. And, uh, and so there was more attention given to safety, but it especially broke through as an issue 
with the publication in 1965 of Ralph Nader's book, Unsafe at Any Speed, in which he highlighted the uh, alleged safety failings of the Chevrolet Corvair compact car. And uh, Nader's book prompted not just a wave of headlines, it prompted investigations in the US Congress, particularly in the Senate, in a committee uh, led by uh, Senators Abe Ribicoff of Connecticut and Robert Kennedy of New York. Industry executives were grilled about safety failings in then current cars, and especially uh, in, the, in the Chevrolet uh, Corvair. And in fact, General Motors had had the embarrassment of having to acknowledge that they had had Ralph Nader investigated and followed uh, as a part to undermine him as a critic of the industry. Uh, but safety gained new awareness and importance. And so as a result of the hearings in Congress, uh, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration was created in legislation passed by the Johnson administration in 1966. And, and so with safety and safety standards uh, becoming a reality, the industry had to face up to something that it had been really putting on the back burner for many years. And uh, uh, this was a major change for the industry, uh, a technological change, an engineering change, also, of course, a marketing and communications change. And uh, this resulted in safety features being phased into uh, American autom automobiles uh, beginning in the uh, late 1960s and then carrying forward. And uh, there were a series of standards that were developed as a result of the creation of the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration for front end collisions and then rear end and side collisions. And that ultimately, ultimately led to passive restraints and the installation of, of um, standard airbags uh, in, in the late 1980s, which were available, by the way, in General Motors cars as early as 1974, following a pilot that GM did with the government in 1973. So the industry has faced change and the world for the industry did change and the industry then had to face a new reality. Safety is one I mentioned, another was pollution. We became aware in the 1960s as a society that many of our urban areas were becoming very polluted as a result of uh, uh, emissions from factories and also especially from vehicles. This was first apparent in Southern California where unique characteristics of the geography surrounding Los Angeles and its unique uh, and, and very pleasant climate created a situation where smog would blanket the metropolitan area for four days uh, as a result of this vehicular driven pollution. That led the state of California and then ultimately the federal government to impose emission standards uh, in uh, or for uh, motor vehicles. And that was another major way in which the world that the industry knew had changed and that the reality was going to be different. And uh, that ultimately led to initiatives like uh, the installation of uh, emission control devices in cars beginning with the 1968 model year. It led to the Clean Air Act passage in 1970, signed by the way, by a Republican president, Richard Nixon. And that, that legislation created the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, and from there on, we had uh, emission standards uh, developed that uh, the industry had to meet uh, in large numbers within a fairly short time. So again, there's another case of where the industry had to change overnight and address a change overnight because our world had changed. And uh, I think that that's, uh, that's a very significant factor.
But probably the biggest changes, the most disruptive changes that the automotive industry faced, and the ones that required substantial overnight reworking of its product, were the two major oil shocks of the 1970s. The first one came in October 1973 as a result of the Yom Kippur War, when the countries that were members of the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, OPEC, decided to boycott uh, and end the flow of oil to nations that supported the state of Israel uh, against the Arab states in that Yom Kippur War. And what that meant was immediate supply disruptions to the Western industrialized nations, most particularly the United States and Canada uh, and Western Europe. And so overnight, oil imports were reduced substantially. And the automotive industry, which had just come off of a major strong selling year in 1973, of what were then largely full-size cars had to overnight retool for a new reality that was likely going to set in where fuel economy was going to be a major priority for buyers and in, in fact, a necessity for buyers to address and that therefore became a necessity for the industry to address. And that meant wholesale overnight changes in the nature of the product that it was building and selling. This was shown most dramatically in the work at General Motors on their full-size cars. Uh, the 1974 cars were the ones that were first affected by the tremendous drop in sales as a result of the OPEC oil embargo. Now that embargo was lifted later on in the calendar year of 1974. By April and May, the embargo had ended, but that was after a half a year of, of uh, dismal sales for full-size cars. So General Motors went back to the, literally back to the drawing board and realized that it had to do something about its full-size line of Chevrolet, Pontiac, Oldsmobile, Buick, and Cadillac cars for North America. And it completely redid its full-size car program for the 1977 model year. And that resulted in full-size cars, which were nearly a foot shorter in length and almost a thousand pounds lighter than the 1974 cars uh, had been. And General Motors put those cars on the street in the fall of 1976 for the beginning of the 1977 model year. And that represents a huge overnight change in the way that company did business and in the product that it brought to the showroom floor. And it brought a product that was not in any way perceived by the customer as having any real deficit in terms of performance, space, uh, cargo capacity, passenger capacity, because there were no major losses there. It was just a more efficiently sized, full-sized vehicle that the company brought to market. And they were followed soon after uh, by Ford and by Chrysler, of course. And uh, those two companies would follow uh, within a couple of years with their own downsized models. But General Motors led the way. And uh, uh, that was first evident in their 1977 B bodies, as they're called, the full-size General Motors cars. We were fortunate enough at the WCX display to be able to have a magnificent 1979 Pontiac Bonneville, which uh, was the uh, uh, embodiment of this change and reflected that change. And it's interesting that in the eyes of someone looking at that car in 2022, it looks like a big car and it is, but it was a downsized car in, in 1979. 